In the early 90s, and later at the uh, Architectural Biennale of Venice uh, 2000, uh, you represented Exta City, uh, blending together uh, text, pictures, graphics, diagrams. Uh, two years ago at the Tate, you uh, represented uh, the, the multicultural uh, London gates uh, of a mixed city using everyday objects. Um, how has your idea of the future city changed at the meantime? Um, between X to city and mixed to city. Well, of course, in the title you can tell that they're related. The mixed to city is the child of X to city. X to city was a broad look at uh, how we how we perceive cities and what we expect cities to be. And I suppose Exeter City is uh, the notion of city that comes to somebody who travels, travels in the mind, and travels physically, is able to put together uh, um, uh, understanding from all sorts of different places. In other words, the life that you lead is your city. And I don't think it matters whether you live in a city like London, which is big, but it's not the world, but it sort of contains the world. So in a sense, it is a metaphor for London. London in its kind of many cultures and many uh, manifestations. Um, also, there was another extra city before. I, mean, I, I first came up with the word in 1992 and I made a small exhibition at the Architectural Association for which there was, uh, uh, it, was a, it was on the threshold of um, uh, digital communications and uh, thoughts about uh, cyberspace uh, and uh, the possibilities that a, that a city could be responsive. And in that first exhibit, I propose that the existing city be added to, not substituted or taken away, but added to, with a series of, of uh, organic, uh, dynamic architectural elements, such as wings and pontoons, and, and that there would be crossover between the normal territories of, um, uh, configured by land ownership and buildings. And it, this first version of Exeter City became a kind of codex for the, for the work that I then did uh, up to the millennium. And then, so when, when I looked at through, through the, uh, the work in Venice in 2000, it was kind of looking at the architecture that had been realized in the context, in the bigger context of this outlook for cities. And, um, and from that, it was possible to, to cite the various projects that we, we had done in our studio in relation to, um, to this, this idea of a city having a kind of uh, reward system that, would, that you, would, you would not just expect it to, be, to work well and to give you a comfortable life and all that, but if we were absolutely honest about the way we live in cities, one of the reasons that one goes to live in a city is to be part of something and to be confronted with the unexpected, that the, there is a kind of um, uh, uh, ecstatic appreciation of cities and in a way the city stimulates us in that way and we can accept or reject it or find other forms of, of as it were, of reward. Mixed to City was a response to a brief, and the, the, the brief in that case was uh, to express the multiculture of London. So I thought the best way to do that was to identify a part of London that was about to change, and then, uh, as it were, put the culture of London in it and express it. So I used lots of found objects, but there were also lots of lots of original new architectural ideas in it. So it was a kind of mixture. So the new architecture, in a sense, was carried along in a tide of the familiar, which of course fits with the things I've been talking about earlier, which is the 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 um, adhesion of new ideas in architecture to those things that are familiar. And then you have done a guide to Exeter City. Well, the guide is. Um, uh, uh, 
it uses the, no the notion of guide we're all familiar with. We've all used guidebooks when we've been to a city that we haven't been to before. So it struck me that the guide was a useful type of book to rework. You know, you don't read a guide from one end to the other normally. You use it for, for a kind of reward system or an access to a place you don't know that well. And it seemed that was a great idea to take up in architecture. So the guide, um, uh, it has six chapters, it has various kinds of texts. Um, it switches from a kind of experiential flow to a, a kind of uh, analytic and, and um, factual description or pseudo-factual. So it's a work of fantasy. It's a work of imagination, but presented as though it were real. And I think that's a useful device in architecture. We always project in architecture. We always try to imagine and at the same time pretend that it's real. And then if you go ahead and build it, it really is real. But uh, this process of pretending that something is real is, as it were, a, a, a refinement of that notion of projecting. And um, uh, that's why in this book it presents simultaneously projects that have been built with projects that have never been built, but they're in the book, they're presented as existing. I also have moved uh, projects from one location to another, from various parts of the world, and put them in, in uh, particular locations um, in, in Exeter City. I've also incorporated the work of other people, lots of other architects. And um, in a sense, I, it's a work of curation as well as a work of imagination. This is your project for the Pop Music Museum. Which I enjoyed so much as a project. It's one of our best projects, I think. But uh, it was extremely badly managed and the exhibition in it was so awful that they, they had to close it after six months. So uh, what happened? The local university bought it and turned it into a music venue for the students of uh, Sheffield Hallam University. So it has a perfect reincarnation. And like the best Roman buildings, there was always another use after. But what I found interesting of this project was your sense of, um, uh, of the geometry. how you use, use it. Mm. Because you said there is no an obligatory entrance in the building. Yes. Well, it was like um, part of a gridded, planned town, but it was as it were, the, the, the crossing was enclosed. And what fascinated me, in fact, this, this idea of four circular drums came because I was driving in Mercatale and I saw some silos, stainless steel silos, and I was thinking to myself, oh, if you could walk in between, it would be the most extraordinary sensation because it would be a kind of inside-out space because of the form of the, the drums. And, uh, and, and that was where it kind of related to this, which is how, with the, the, um, the, the Villa Capra has a, a, a kind of confusing relationship between the four porticos, and at the same time, it's a device, an orientation device for a landscape. So that's why I thought it was similar, because when you would enter into that central space, there'd be that kind of turning and um, uh, question uh, over the, of your orientation in the space. I mean, it's, it's geometric. It's geometric, but disorienting, which is an en enigmatic relationship between the geometry and the experience of the space. Could you describe your theories, your work, in only one statement? Uh, capricious. <laughs> Thank you very much. Pleasure.